So this is the last in this series, this summer series, Knowing the Heart of God and, and, and Living in It. Uh, we've really broken it up in, into four uh, uh, mini-series, mini if you will. And, and we've looked at the characteristics of God, or four of the characteristics of God, in invite, connect, apprentice, and send. And, and the springboard is that humankind, um, in all of our history, every single human being and every single civilization has sought after God, sought to know God. Uh, and, and, and we see this every, everywhere we look, even if we look inside of ourselves, we want to know God. Uh, and, and the thing is, we can't know God of ourselves, so God comes to us in Jesus Christ. In the, in the Gospel of John, the very first uh, chapter, it says, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son of God, he has revealed him, he has made him known. Uh, so throughout this, this time, this summer, we, we've looked at these characteristics of God, uh, both to receive and then to emulate as, as we reflect this in our lives. Uh, he is the inviting God, and we hear the words of Jesus, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whew. Where do you need to hear that? Where do you need to know this God who invites you to rest in Jesus, where do you just have great burdens in your heart. And the neat thing is that we receive that, and then God's Spirit touches our hearts so that we can be the ones inviting others to receive the same gift. And our God is a connecting God. Jesus didn't, with a big uh, cosmic bullhorn from way out here, kind of yell into the, our existence but rather, he became one of us. He, he took on flesh and blood, and he steps into our reality. Um, he connects with us in relationship. In fact, in fact, that's really what the good news is all about. Uh, we were created only to be whole and complete in that relationship, and what Jesus does is connect us again because sin disconnects us. Um, and then he calls us uh, to live in this, with this heart of connection, this heart of relationship with those around us, beginning with those who are closest to us. Um, and, and, and apprenticing or discipling, Jesus didn't step onto the earth and go to the Hebrew University and say, I'm gonna teach, uh, I'm, I'm gonna teach mess, uh, me, me, Messianic Prophecies 101. That's, that's not the way he did things. He, um, he, he called 12 and he did life with them. Yeah, and, and so he taught them as they followed him. Uh, and, and we're called not only to be his disciples, but then the mission of the church is to go and make disciples, just like Jesus did. You see, we, we, we've received and, and we've looked to live in it every step of the way. We're, we're in the, the final little mini-series of Send, um, and, and uh, today the, the, the little thing I really want to focus on is experience as, as a great teacher. Have you ever seen a car like this on the road, a uh, student driver? <laughs> What, what do you do when you see one of those? <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I kind of try to go around them. Do you, you guys do that? I mean, I, I know it's a necessary evil. I know they're not going to learn unless they drive the car, but I'm kind of frightened of them. And, and I, I think it's when I, I went to high school in, in the dark ages when they still had uh, student uh, ed or, or dr driver's ed in high school, and we did these big machines for a while, you know, for days, like, like two, two weeks we got in these machines. Anybody else do that? I'm just, yeah. And, and you learned how to drive the machine. And I'll never forget, they would take five of us at a time in a real car, and I was in the back with four guy, with four other guys, and I remember the guy next to me. I didn't know him very well, um, but after this, we became really good friends. Uh, uh, his, his name was Rob, and so the first driver was up, and honestly, we went through a near-death experience, he and I. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and so all of us, I mean, and we knew, I mean, that's the only way you learn, right? But, but man, it's crazy. I, that, that's why when my kids knew, uh, had to learn how to drive, I took them all to the local cemetery. That, that, I'm not lying. That's where they learned. I figured they couldn't kill anybody. You know, they, they, could, <laughs> they, they, they could run over the stones, but they couldn't kill anybody. That, that's where they learned to drive. Uh, but you won't learn until you do it. Uh, I remember the first time I, I was going to buy a car with a clutch, and I didn't know how to drive a clutch yet. And a friend of mine, he owned a Falcon Sprint. Anybody know what that car is, Falcon Sprint? They are the hardest clutch to drive on the face of the earth, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so he, t he was going to teach me how to do this, and he takes me on this steep hill on Las Tunas Drive, which, is a, which was the main, main drag where I grew up, and, and, and he does it in traffic, and the stoplight is red, and a guy is two inches from my butt, right? And I say, Jim, I don't know if I can do this. And he says, well, we're not going anywhere unless you do. 
I learned how to drive a clutch by doing it, right? It's the only way you learn. Experience is a great teacher. That's the way it is with this sending stuff, right? Jesus starts with, he says, as the Father has sent me. And I, you know, sometimes we just blast through these words and, and they just are words on paper. But think about this. God the Father sent Jesus to you. Where do you need to hear that in your life? That God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to you. This Jesus gave up his very life to to connect us to God again. And he won. That's what Easter's all about. He won. I, I don't know what loneliness you bring with you. I don't know what struggles or what shadows. I don't know what guilt you bring with you today. I don't know where you need to hear this. That God sent Jesus to you. But I know that every time we talk about this, it's it's not just dead words on paper or coming out of a mouth. These words are called the sword of the spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, right now, for every single one of us, is touching our hearts right in that place. You know that place you wouldn't ever share with anybody because it might make you look weak? Or they may not like you? God knows. That place where you really need to know this Savior has been sent for you? Yeah, that's where the Spirit wants to touch you right now. We not only begin in this place, we never, ever leave this place. This is, uh, this is the power source. Uh, the mitochondria, you guys know that one? Right? Power source of the cell. This is the power source of our lives. In his love, Jesus sent Jesus, God sent Jesus to you. To you. Right in that place where you need him in this moment. Whew, isn't that something? That's where Jesus started with these disciples, and they were so frightened on Easter morning. They had the doors and windows locked. He says, I'm here, and the Father sent me to you. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You know what that means? What I did just now, you can do. You can do with your husbands, and with your wives, and with your moms and dads, and with your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors and friends, and to the whole world. You can bring them this Jesus that was sent for them. Isn't that awesome stuff? Now, um, you you, you might say, wait a minute, I I don't know how to do that, or or how can I do that, or, or... how can I begin to do that? And, and this is where the idea of experience comes, comes in for me, right? Um, uh, when, when, I was, uh, when I was in Hungary for the, for the first uh, time, I, J- Jane and I went to, uh, for my daughter's, I'm sorry, we went for our, for our, our daughter's wedding. And, and I, so some of you know this story, but I, I still am amazed at it. I've never been on a short-term mission trip. Yeah, I've never experienced that. But, but it's like I've done it. Uh, we, we were staying in Vienna one night, and then we were going to go on to, to Hungary. And Jane wakes up at 3 in the morning. She hops into the shower, and she falls, and she breaks two ribs. And she's in a lot of pain, right? And so I wake up, um, and I'm, uh, it's a driving rainstorm, and I'm looking for some help. Uh, I, I don't shave, and I don't put on any deodorant, and I, don't, and I don't brush my teeth, and I have the clothes on now. I just throw them on that I, that I just flew 15 hours in, right? And I'm running down the street. Have you ever noticed that people don't speak English in foreign countries? It, it's, it's the craziest thing, you know? And so I don't speak their language, and I'm looking for anybody that I can say, hey, I need help. Get me an ambulance. Finally, I found somebody. We, we go to the hospital. I'm there all day long. Get her settled. She's got to spend the night. And now I'm coming home on, on, on the train, uh, the mass transit there in Vienna. Um, 
did I say that I stunk? Uh, and, and that I hadn't shaved, and that I hadn't had any sleep. And a guy, I have no idea why he did this, but he said, how you doing? <laughs> he started this conversation with me. Uh, and so I tell him everything I just told you, except that I now realize that I was speaking louder than I would normally because I was very tired. Uh, and and uh, so, so then he said, I don't know why he did this, but he says, you know, so what do you do for a living in America? And I said, my pastor, says, oh, that must be hard. He said, what do you mean? Why, why would it be hard? He says, well, because no one ever listens to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said, honest. <laughs> and, and I said, no, it's easy because everybody knows we're broken. Now, here's a guy that's saying we're broken, and he looks about as broken as you can get, right? He stinks. His clothes are sticking to him. They dry to his skin. Right? He's trying to find his way back in a foreign, in a foreign uh, uh, city, doesn't know what the heck he's doing. And I'm saying, no, it's easy to tell people about Jesus because everybody knows we're broken. And the guy looks at me, and it clicks. You see it in his eyes. And I look up, and I've been talking too loud, and like 20 people are around me listening to this. And it, it really hits me. I think, wow, this is what it must be like to be on a short-term mission trip. God just does stuff. And I got to tell you, you take that stuff home. Because if people listen to your stories there, they're going to listen to your stories here, right? And just a few days later, uh, we were at this party. The, the, uh, the, the other teachers threw them the, the, this party because they, they were getting married. And I had these five older teachers. They, they come up to me, and we have a, a translator because they don't speak English, and I don't speak Hungarian. Uh, and and, um, and there's, the first thing they asked me is, how could you possibly let your daughter come here? And I have to explain that in America, well, we don't put chains on our daughters. You know, we kind of let them do what they want, right? And, and, then, and, and then they're saying, but thank you because she taught us how to hope. And if you can't hold up Jesus when somebody's asking you about hope, you just can't hold up Jesus, right? It's like God put this ball on the tee, on the tee and had me hit it, right? And I realize that in my everyday life here, I live too fast. It's the same God. He's putting the ball up on the tee every day. And I realize I'm just not seeing it. You see, that's, that's the idea of this learning by experience. You, you bring it home with you. I, I've seen this. My uh, youngest son and his wife work for Campus Crusade for Christ, but all over the world, sharing Jesus with, with, on college campuses. But what I really notice in their everyday lives, the last time I was there, we walked into a donut shop, and before we were done, this, this gal had told my, my son her, her life story, and he was telling her about Jesus. True story, man. It's, it's because he's had the experience of listening and showing people he really cares and, and, and how that all connects. We, when we've sent kids to, uh, on short-term mission trips here, we've done that with our high school kids. When, when we've done that, they've come home, and, and I've seen that in their lives. They're not only changed here personally, but in their outlook. They, they've got eyes that see a little bit better. It's how we learn to live in the sentness of who we are. Uh, in, in the gospel, this is, don't notice this is Mark 1, right? So it's talking about what Jesus does. And what, what did he do when he walked the earth? Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Okay, so he preaches things, right? He, he pre pre proclaims the good news. Then after the evening sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. You see this again and again in the gospels. Go home and read one. See if I'm lying to you. Jesus does three things. He proclaims the good news of the kingdom. He heals the sick. He casts out the demons. He pushes back the evil. It's what Jesus does again and again and again. All the disciples are with him when he's doing this. So you go five chapters later. Now Jesus is sending out the disciples on a short-term mission trip. They're going out two by two. You, you, you know what they're supposed to do? This is what they're supposed to do. Oh, they're, they're, they're going to preach. They're going to drive out the demons. They're going to heal the sick. They've seen Jesus do this, see? And now he sends them out on a short-term mission trip so they can experience it. And they can come back and talk about it, and they can live more in that reality in their everyday lives. I'm not making this stuff up. Sometimes, so sometimes we, we, we look at what Jesus says, and, and we look at how he, how he did things, and, and we're kind of just like uh, uh, dumb and deaf almost, right? We, 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 we think, oh, well, that's nice words on paper, and I understand what he did. No, no, no. It's written down so that we get it, so that we start to do it. So that we put it into practice. So that we live our lives with our eyes open looking for the experience. 
in, in the missional community that, that meets my house sometimes, we, we, we try to tell these stories of what God's doing around us. Open our eyes and see the experience of the stories. It's all around us. Go ahead. Go to the next one for me. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. It's like uh, the guy that gets married and he hears all those wonderful words about love, but he never puts it into practice. Doesn't do him any good, does it? James doubles down as he says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Live in that reality. Experience it. Look to experience it. Experience is a great teacher. I've, I love the book of Acts. I've been reading it in my, um, in my personal devotions lately. And it's, 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 an, it's an amazing book. If, if, if you just read, uh, and I would invite you to do so. Uh, throughout that book, God is keeping score. I, I, I think this is, this is like an aha that, that you can't miss, but you forget sometimes. Pe- the, the, the day of Pentecost, you had 3,000 saved. Then a little while later, it says, now there's 5,000 saved. And then in the, what we read, it says, there are many priests that came to, to faith in Jesus. And, and, then, and, and then it says, the word of the Lord grew. And, and, and then uh, they, they go to Samaria, and you have so many people coming to faith in Jesus that they got to send the apostles to figure out what's going on. And then you have Peter sent to the Gentiles and more come to faith. And God's keeping score through the whole thing, and he's saying, this is what it looks like. Right? In the reading we had, um, uh, the, what, what, what's going on is that you had this big Jerusalem church, mostly made up of, almost completely made up of Jews, right? That had now become Christians. Uh, you had the Jews that were home people, homeboys, right? That, that were from Jerusalem. Then you had the Jews that were, that, that were from the Greek cities, okay, far away. And, and I think as I put this together in my head, I think many of them maybe had come into town for the Pentecost festival, had become Christians with Peter's teaching and had stayed there. Uh, but, but, but maybe they had just moved back to, to the, their, their home where they had come from. I, I don't know. But they had grown up in these Greek cities. And so they complained to the church that their widows and orphans were not getting taken care of. Now, now this was qu- quite a complaint when you think about it because probably most of the money they had bringing, coming in as, a, as an ecclesia, as a church, was, was to take care of these people, w- w- when you think about it, right? Uh, and, and so th- there, was this, th- 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 there was this squabble. And the 12, the disciples said, hey, uh, the apostles said, hey, we're, we're not going to handle this. We're supposed to preach and teach and pray. What you guys need to do is appoint seven men from among you to take care of this. And so they did. And, and th- th- these are the guys that they appointed. Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And you wouldn't notice this with, our, with your, I wouldn't either, in my, with my Western mind. But one of the things that, that ought to jump out at us, and it would if we, we had Jewish backgrounds, is that all these guys had Greek names. So the way the church, the, 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 the way the church, the ecclesia saw this is they, they took the newbies, the new guys, the outsiders, who had the problem, and they put them in positions of authority, and they trusted them even making, they trusted their hearts in Christ even to make decisions about money. Boy, what a difference than out, out in the world, huh? And so the, the, the seven guys then, they, they, they say, you, you're, you're going to do this. And the amazing thing is that... Uh, through the experience, uh, we know that two of them went on to do awesome things. We don't know about the other five. I'm not so convinced they didn't go on to do awesome things. It's not recorded, right? But almost immediately, we have this. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. So here's a guy. He goes from waiting on tables. He goes from experiencing what it means to be a servant, not just reading it on paper, not just saying, I gotta be a servant, but actually doing it, experiencing it. He goes from there that now he's doing these great and wonder miraculous signs as a servant among the people. And then as as this narrative goes farther, he he gets called out by by the, uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders and he preaches this kicker of a sermon and he tells them that they've killed the Lord of life and he holds up Jesus and he says, this is the one and they get so upset with him because they can't shut him down that they, that they stone him to death. 
So this guy that started out waiting on tables, somehow through all that experience, he grows to a place where he's standing up against the, the greatest powers of, of, of the city, and he's proclaiming Jesus Christ in the face of death. And he's grown so much that in the fa- as he's dying, he's a reflection of Jesus. He says, Lord, take my spirit. Does that remind you of anything? And then he says, don't hold this sin against them. Does that remind you of anything? Through this experience, Stephen has grown to a point where he's living this sent life, even to the point of with his dying breath, he's praying for his enemies. Those things happen only as you put Jesus' words into action, as you experience what he calls you to experience. Philip, he's the other one. Just a little while later in, in Acts, it talks about how, now Philip was, was, you know, you had Stephen and Philip. Philip's been waiting on tables. He's learned how to serve in that way. And all of a sudden, we see this about him. He went, af- after uh, Stephen was killed, you had this persecution in the whole church and they were scattered. Philip happened to go down to Samaria. And, and from waiting on tables, now he's preaching the Christ there. And we know that a whole lot of people came to faith in Jesus because pretty soon the apostles have to come to Samaria and see what the heck is going on. You, you can read it for yourself. Philip, this guy who was waiting on tables, all of a sudden is, is, is living this sent life, right? And, and it doesn't stop with that. A little while later, we have this same Philip. The Lord takes him to a place, and he says, see that guy over there? He was, he was an Ethiopian. He was a eunuch. He was in the, the queen's court. He's trying to read Isaiah. Couldn't figure it out. So, so Philip, the spirit of God told Philip, he ran alongside and said, hey, do you, do you want somebody to tell you about that? And through that, uh, uh, this Ethiopian takes the good news of Jesus to his home country. And, and, and many people date the ancient Ethiopian church from that place. Philip was waiting on tables, for goodness sakes. See, he grew. How did he grow? By doing it. By experiencing it. What it meant to be a servant. What it meant to be sent. And there's a third place he's mentioned. It goes on. They, this group now, they go to Caesarea, stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist. You see that? And notice it's saying one of the seven. So it's telling you, hey, this is one of the seven. The guy waiting on a table. Now he's known as the Evangelist. I, I, I got a proposition for you. If you find any other person in the New Testament who is called the evangelist, I'll give you $50. Now, we're all supposed to be evangelists. We're all supposed to do the work of an evangelist. But Philip is the only one that's called the evangelist. Dude was waiting on tables, man. Right? He learned how to serve. Through experience, he learned what it, was, what it meant to be sent. And, and he's called the evangelist. And he's passing it on to his daughters, all of whom now proclaim the good news of Jesus. They, 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 they prophesy in the name of Christ. We grow. Um, it's why you only have a permit for what, six months to a year? You can't get a license until you drive under a... We, we grow, see? We grow as we put Jesus' words into practice, as we experience. That's... That's why we have this whole sun ministry, right? To give us experience to grow. Um, whether it's in this missional lifestyle, just to open our eyes and see what God could be for us, um, see where he's putting the ball in the tee and what it looks like. Uh, this, uh, you, many of you know, I just got back from uh, Europe and we went to uh, Madeira, an island in Spain for a little while. And uh, we had a great day. This guy took uh, my son, Jeff, and I uh, surfing at, at this great place. And, and I tell you what, you get to go surfing with your kid, that's a good day, right? Uh, but, of course, I petered out before he did. And so I'm sitting on the beach, and the guy that took us, he had been in the water, he came down and sat next to me. And, and I don't know why, but he starts talking about church stuff and God stuff. Maybe he asked me what I did for a living. I don't know. But we're talking about this, and I had this feeling I'm completely missing with this guy because he was talking religion, I was talking Jesus, and we weren't connecting. You ever do that? Yeah. And, and that night, about six hours later, when, when he drops us off, he, he says how much that meant to him and, and how he was going to take it with him. And I thought, oh, that's something else to learn, that 
It's not up to you. God's there doing his stuff, right? You learn this by experiencing it, by, by doing it, see? You learn the mission of lifestyle by, by, by looking to live that way or, or how to come together and do things as a congregation by doing them. How to have missional eyes as, 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 as we, we open our eyes to the panorama that the LWML gives us. As, and, and these short-term mission trips, we, we haven't done much of this with adults. But it's a step we want to take so that we can have the experience and grow by doing. Um, if, you, if you want to be a part of this, if you have an interest in it, uh, I'm just going to put these guys, you can call the church office, you can talk to me, you can talk to one of these guys, Rick or Tim. Um, just something we're, we're starting to get together. We're um, looking from Alaska to, to Mexico to, we're looking everywhere to see uh, where God's opening doors. I, my, my oldest son, Jeffy, lives in San Diego, and he's now been three times to uh, Tijuana to build homes uh, there for the, for the very poor, and it's changed him. He, he's, he's learned by doing that's what happens. Uh, so if, if you got an interest, if you, if you want to ask questions, if you want to help out, uh, these are the guys, all right? As the Father has sent me, and we never, ever leave that place, right? Where do you need to hear that? Jesus is sent for you. I am sending you to another to bring me into that one place they need to know me. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And from Philemon, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Knowing the heart of God and living in it, the sending God experience is a great teacher. So this week, where do you need to be renewed in the grace of the one who was sent for you? By grace through faith, receive it anew. As one who is now sent by Jesus, where or how can you step out and experience what this means in your life? By grace through faith, do it. And finally, pray that God would lead us forward in our short-term mission trip focused here at St. Matthew as well as how you can be a part of it because experience is a great teacher. And may God's spirit lead you and lead us together as we go forward. Uh, Amen.